So my name is Angela. I work at Q Ward at West Middlesex Hospital, which is part of Chelsea and Westminster Foundation Trust. As you can see, there's a bit about myself. Um, I work on a stroke unit. So just to give anyone who's not aware of stroke patients, many of our patients have lots of difficulties post-stroke. They have cognitive impairments, swallowing problems, and loss of mobility. So have a look at this picture. You can see that bacteria entering the oral cavity. Now I just want you to think about the last patients you looked after, a particular patient or a group of patients. Now recall when you last brushed your teeth. How often do you brush your teeth? Think back to the patients you looked after last. Did you help them clean their mouth or did your colleagues help them? How often did you do that? And was it the same as when you clean your mouth? I just want you to also think, are you aware of how many species there are of bacteria in the oral cavity? You may be surprised to know that it's over 700 different types of bacteria. This is both made up of good and bad bacteria. If we don't help our patients break down and clean this bacteria, it ends up forming biofilm. As Ryan mentioned earlier, and as you've done in the poll, hospital acquired infections, 23% of these are hospital acquired pneumonia. I don't know how most of you feel, but for me, I feel that hospital acquired pneumonia is not seen as, as important as things perhaps as CDF, bacteremia, because they're not reportable, they don't come with a fine for the trust. Having a hospital acquired pneumonia increases the length of stay by 10.5 days. As you all correctly answered earlier, it also has a cost of 4,500. Hospital acquired pneumonia obviously has serious implications for our patients it can carry a mortality rate of 30%, 30% of patients that potentially we could have prevented from dying. The BACCN paper details how we care for ventilated patients and non-ventilated patients. You can see if you have a look at the recommendations. For ventilated and non-ventilated, they recommend it's the same intervals and frequency. They recommend that we should use an antiseptic solution such as clohexidine, from my own personal experience working with clohexidine, you need to make sure you follow your trust protocol as a lots of trust ensure that this needs to be prescribed on a prescription chart. They, we should moisturize after cleaning. So we need to use a mouth moisturizer. There's lots of different ones available that can be used inside the oral cavity. We need to ensure if the patient's on oxygen that it's non-flammable. What we found and we'll mention earlier that BACCN recommends that it's good to use um, tools that are kept at the bedside. What did we want to achieve? We wanted to improve our patient's standard of care outside of the ITU environment. We wanted to develop an oral care policy and protocol that could be used across our ward. We wanted to reduce the risk of mortality and morbidity and improve our patient's experiences and outcomes. So how did we set about achieving these? With the help of Stryker and the reps that we had, we looked at doing a compliance audit. We looked at a cost analysis of our current products compared to if we were to use the new products. We did intervention questionnaires pre and post intervention. And we, with the help of Stryker, we carried out a one month trial using the Q4 kits. For us to start off with, we obviously couldn't have made this available to all of our patients. And we felt for us as a stroke unit, the nail by mouth high risk patients that had swollen problems were our priority. As mentioned previously, in our one month trial, we focused on our high risk nail by mouth patients. But we felt that this wasn't right just to only include these patients. As a trust and as a nurses on our ward, we wanted to make sure that all our patients had good mouth care and were supported. So we developed the traffic light system. So you can see here, we had high risk patients, medium risk patients and low risk patients. So I like the traffic lights, red, amber and green. So this is when we started to develop our policy and protocol and assessment tool. We then completed an audit. We looked at patient notes four months in 2017 and then did the same four months in 2018. The results were fantastic. If you look on the poster, our antibiotic use, we reduced the dosages by 70%. Pre-intervention in those four months, we'd given 749. 
post-intervention, this went down to 222. Not only is this beneficial for our patient, but as you're aware, when you're given antibiotics, having to mix antibiotics, put cannulas in for patients, this is time consuming. Cannulas come with risks for patients of risk of infection. So reducing this is absolutely brilliant for our patients. As I mentioned earlier, just in the one month trial we did, we improved our compliance by 310%. It went from 20% at the beginning of the one month trial to 82% compliance with our staff just by having the products on the ward, training our staff and having them visible by the bedside. One of the most fantastic results that we came up with is that pre-intervention in those four months, we had a mortality rate of eight. Post-intervention in 2018 for those four months, this went down to two. So this is 75% reduction mortality which is absolutely brilliant that we've managed to reduce our mortality rate and save patients' lives. In the same four months, 2017 compared to 2018, our hospital-acquired pneumonia rates were 30% in the four months in 2017, which then went down to 10 in 2018, which is a massive reduction. Just the savings that we could have for our trust, and which obviously is what is pitched to our trust to why we wanted to implement the tools. We had nearly £80,000 saving for our trust by implementing the tools, reducing antibiotic use, length, and the cost of extended length of stay and to treat hospital acquired pneumonia. What's amazing for us is the recognition now that we've had for the work we've done, and we've been so fortunate with the help, help of Stryker to have our work published in the British Journal of Nursing, which goes into more detail of what we've achieved, how we did this, and evidence-based practice for this. So overall, with how would I summarize and give advice to any of you if you wanted to put a project like this together? The main thing I think for anyone with a trust and any business is that you really need to have a good detailed cost analysis. Lots of trusts will always question why you want to spend more money on something that seemingly at first seems more, more costly to a trust which is why it's beneficial to have a cost analysis and have a good business case to how you can improve it, what the outcomes could be and how much you can save the trust and improve things for your patients. Promoting mouth care. This was a big um, challenge for us. We did lots of mouth care awareness weeks. We did these in the canteen, um, at the front of the entrance of both hospitals. We wanted to raise awareness, not only with our staff, but patients and relatives so that everyone felt empowered to understand why we were doing that and to question if they were receiving poor care. On our ward, we rolled out mouth care champions and we gave them badges when they'd received their training, just so they felt empowered and they could support our vision, both across the trust and on our ward. As I mentioned earlier, we presented to our senior managers as we felt that if you could have the support from the senior managers all the way down is far easier to be supported. So we went to directors board, patient safety groups and our team briefs. And we, we've asked the biggest challenge is that we work cross sites. So our trust is consisted of two sites and myself and my colleague only work on one side. So it was very difficult and the biggest challenge was making sure that we could roll out and support both trusts, which is where Stryker and the reps came in to help with training. Thank you for your time and I think we're going to go to some questions.